All right, this is the third and final video on uh, testing for uh, advanced Android and Kotlin testing. Uh, I got here from codelabs.developers.google.com, search for testing, and it is, where'd it go? Right here, this one, 5.3. Should do start. I'm going to start up Android Studio. Um, yeah, so the first two videos, testing basics, dependency injection, uh, test doubles, the fakes, the mocks. This one's on uh, testing coroutines and Jetpack integrations. All right, well, you learn how to test coroutines, view model scoped coroutines, air edge cases, room, uh, data binding with espresso, right end to end tests, and test global app navigation. All right, cool. Let's start this. All right, if you finish all the non optional steps, uh, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we got to check out end code lab two and the project that we've been working on. It's uh, Android testing. Okay, so I've already got it going. Okay, so this is end code lab one. So, uh, We want end code lab two. Check out. We'll have to do, I'm gonna do a force checkout because I don't want to save those changes. Um, let me just uh, let me just make sure. Let's see, get status. All right, looks good. Okay, now let's see. Um, got that checked out. End code lab two, good. All right, it says run the sample app. Okay, once you downloaded the to-do app, open it in Android Studio, run it, should compile, explore that by doing the following. Okay, this is like the same from the previous two code labs, so I'm not gonna do that a third time. All right. Introduction to and review of testing coroutines. All right, coroutine codex queued synchronous or asynchronously. When code is run synchronously, a task completely finishes before execution moves on to the next task. When code is running asynchronously, tasks run in parallel. Okay, yep, I understand that. Asynchronous code is always, almost always used for long running tasks such as network. Database calls uh, can also be difficult to test. There are two common reasons for this. Asynchronous code tends to be non-deterministic. That means, what this means is if a test runs operations A and B in parallel multiple times, sometimes A will finish first, sometimes B finishes first. This can cause flaky tests. Yep, I'm familiar with that. Uh, when testing, you often need to ensure some sort of synchronization me mechanism for asynchronous code, test run on a testing thread. Uh, as, your, as your test runs code on different threads or makes new coroutines, this work is started asynchronously separate from the test thread. Meanwhile, the test coroutine will keep executing instructions in parallel. The test might finish before either of the fired off tasks finish. <laughs> Okay, synchronization time, assert statements right there. Okay, so this is the test thread. Running operations asynchronously, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, in Kotlin, a common mechanism for running code asynchronously is coroutines. When testing asynchronous code, you need to make your code deterministic and provide synchronization mechanisms. 
The following classes and methodologies help with that. Use run blocking test or run blocking using test coroutine dispatcher for local tests. Pausing co coroutine execution to test the state of the code at an exact place and time. You'll start by exploring the difference between run blocking test and run blocking. Okay, step one, observe how to run basic coroutines and tests. To test code that includes suspend functions, you need to do the following. Add Kotlin X coroutines test, test dependency to your app's build.gradle file. Annotate the test class or test function with experimental coroutines API. Surround the code with run blocking tests so that your test fails, so that your test, oh, waits for the coroutine to finish. I don't know why I read fails. All right. When writing test doubles, such as fake test repository, you must use run blocking instead. In, in the previous code lab, you did both of those things. Yep, I remember that. Uh, open your app's build.gradle file, find Kotlin coroutines test. This is provided for you. All right, let's have a look at that. Uh, Gradle. Okay. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Cool, cool. Uh, let's see. Test, it would be. There we go, this one. Awesome. Wait, oh, I wanted to update something. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't remember what I wanted to update, so maybe I will later. Room, material, swipe refresh, room, okay, view model live data, navigation. Okay, let's keep going. All right, uh, Kotlin Coroutines Test is an experimental library for testing coroutines. It includes utilities for testing coroutines, including run blocking test. You must use run blocking test whenever you want a coroutine, you want to test a, you want a coroutine from a test. Usually, this is when you need to call a suspend function from a test. Uh, take a look at the, this example from task detail test fragment. Pay attention to the lines that say, look here. All right, task detail fragment test task detail mm. let me close all these and I'll, I don't like to have them all open all right which one am I looking up again um, okay <clears throat> look here where does it say look here um i don't see it yeah okay i don't have that but whatever i'll just read the code here okay active Task detail fragment test. Am I looking in the right one? Task detail fragment test. Uh, yep, looks like I am. Okay. Uh, okay, use to use run blocking test. You annotate the function or class with at experimental coroutines API, wrap the code calling suspend function function see activate test details displayed in UI Act, test details displayed in UI um, and the class is annotated cool okay when you use any functions from Kotlin coroutines test annotate the class or function with 
that since Kotlin coroutines test is still experimental and the API may change. If you don't do this, you'll get a lint warning. Run blocking test is used in the code above because you are calling repository that save task. Uh, active task, which is a suspend function. Run blocking test handles both running the code deterministically and providing a synchronization mechanism. Run blocking test takes in a block of code and blocks the test thread until all the coroutines it starts are finished. It also runs the code and the coroutines immediately, skipping any calls to delay and in the order they are called. In short, it runs them in deterministic order. Okay, run blocking test essentially makes your coroutines run like non-coroutines by giving you a coroutine context specifically for text co test code. You do this in your test because it's important that the code runs in the same way every single time, synchronous and deterministic. Step two, observe run blocking and test doubles. There's another function run blocking. Okay, what was the first one? Run blocking test, oh I see. Okay, uh, let's see. Which is used when you need to use coroutines in your test and in your test doubles as opposed to your test classes. Use run block, using run blocking looks very similar to run blocking tests as you wrap it around a code block to use it. Take a look at this example from fake repository. Note that since run blocking is not part of the uh, Kotlin coroutines test library, you do not need to use the experimental coroutines annotation. Uh, yep, I see that. All right, similar to run blocking test, run blocking is used here because refresh tasks is a suspend function. Okay. Uh, run blocking and run blocking test. Both run blocking and run blocking test block the current thread and wait until any associated coroutine is launched in the Lambda complete. In addition, run blocking test has the following behaviors meant for testing. It skips delays so your tests run faster. It adds testing related assertions to the end of the coroutine. These assertions fail if you launch a coroutine and it continues running after the end of run blocking. Lambda. Uh, which is possible, which is a possible coroutine leak, or if you have an uncaught exception, it gives you timing control over the coroutine execution. So why use run blocking in your test doubles, like fake test repository? Sometimes you will need a coroutine for a test double, in which case you do need to block the current thread. This is so that when your test doubles are used in a test case. The thread blocks and allows the coroutine to finish before the test code does. All right, test doubles, although aren't actually defining a test case, so they need they don't need and shouldn't use all the speci test specific features or run blocking test. In summary, tests require deterministic behavior so they aren't flaky. Normal coroutines are non-deterministic because they run code asynchronously. Uh, Kotlin coroutines test is the gradle dependency for run blocking tests. Writing test classes meaning classes with test functions use run blocking to test to get deterministic behavior. Writing test doubles using run blocking. Okay. Task coroutines and view models. In this step, uh, you'll <clears throat> you learn how to test view models that use coroutines. All coroutines require a coroutine scope. Coroutine scope control the lifetimes of coroutines. When you cancel a scope, or technically the coroutine's job, which you can learn more about here, all the coroutines running in the scope are canceled. Since you might start long running work from a view model, you'll often find yourself creating and running coroutines inside view models. Normally, you you'd need to create and Configure a new coroutine scope manually for each view model to run any coroutines. This is a lot of boilerplate. To avoid this, lifecycle view model KTX provides an extension function called view model scope. View model scope returns a coroutine scope associated with each view model. View model scope is configured for use in that particular view model. 
what this means specifically is that the view model scope is tied to the view model such that when the view model is cleaned up on cleared is called the scope is canceled this insert ensures that when your view model goes away so does all the coroutine work associated with it this avoids wasted work and memory leaks awesome uh, view model scope uses the dispatcher's main coroutine dispatcher a coroutine dispatcher controls how a coroutine runs including what threads the coroutine runs on Dispatcher main puts the coroutine on the UI or main thread. This makes sense as a default for view model coroutines because often view models manipulate the UI. This worked well in production code, but for local tests, uh, tests that run on your local machine and the test source set, the usage of dispatcher's main causes an issue. Dispatcher's main uses Android's looper.get main looper. The main looper is the execution loop for a real application. The main looper is not available by default in local tests because you're not running the full application. To address this, use the method set, set main to modify dispatcher's main to use test coroutine dispatcher. Test coroutine dispatcher is a dispatcher specifically meant for testing. Next, you'll write tests for a view model code that uses view model scope. You can learn more about view model scope in blogspot. Uh, someone's blog. Okay. Okay. Add this new test method and tasks view model test. Event. Okay. Adding an event. R. Import R. Okay. Run this test. Observe that it fails with the following error. Uh, okay, let's run it. Taking a while. Okay. It's an exception, main thread, state exception. Okay. For test, dispatch set main can be used. Okay, the error states that the dispatch.main has failed to initialize. The underlying reason not explained in the error is the lack of Android's looper.get main looper. The error message does tell you to use dispatcher.set main from Kotlin coroutines test. Go ahead and do just that. All right, replace dispatcher.main with test coroutine dispatcher. Uh, okay. Do I need all this? I'm gonna copy all three of those. This is taking forever. Am I in the right one? Let's see. App before, so I, do I? Okay, so there's you can have several befores. Okay. Yep. It tells why it failed. Okay. Okay, so I need all three of those things, the functions. Okay. Import that, import that. These are just, okay, dispatchers. Oh, it's extension functions, looks like, yep. All right, I don't feel like looking through all that, okay. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, run your test again, now it passes. Uh, Oh, I see. Dispatcher set main, and you do it with that test dispatcher. Do I need to experiment the coroutines API if it's already in the class? I don't think I do. Oh, whatever. Let me run that test again.
right. And there we go, it passed. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Add coroutine, co main coroutine rule. If you're using coroutines in your app, any local test that involves calling code in a view model is highly likely to call code which uses view model scope. Instead of copy and pasting the code to set up and tear down the test coroutine dispatcher into each test class, you can make custom J make a custom J unit rule to avoid this boilerplate code. J unit rules are classes where you can define generic testing code that can execute before, after, or during a test. It's a way to take your code to take your code that would have been in the before or after and put it in a, in a class where it can be reused. Make a J unit rule now. I did not know this. Okay, main coroutine rule. We're gonna put that in at that level, okay. Uh, right here. And what was it called again? Main, I'm just gonna copy it. Good. All right, did that. Copy the whole class. Test watcher, oh, that's a G unit. Uh, okay, I think all the imports you're gonna want to use J unit if there's optional. Oops. Okay. All right, so that's the rule. And now we have to use the rule. Some things to notice. Main coroutine rule extends test watcher, which implements test rule interface. This is what makes coroutine rule a J unit rule. Um, let's see. The starting and finished methods um, match what you wrote in your before and after functions. They also run before and after each test. Main coroutine rule implements test coroutine scope to which you pass in test coroutine dispatcher. This gives main coroutine rule the ability to control coroutine timing using the co test coroutine dispatcher you pass in. You'll see an example of this in the next step. Main coroutine rule and many other concepts covered here ex are explained in detail in the talk testing coroutines. Oh, it's a, on YouTube, okay. Use a new J unit rule in a test, open tasks, view model test, replace test dispatcher and your before and after code with the main coroutine rule. Okay, so. Does it have the code at the end? Do we replace all of that? I think we do. That would make sense. We replace all of it. So everything we wrote here with that. I believe. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, notice, uh, let's see. To use J unit rule, you instantiate the rule and annotate it with get rule. Okay, run the complete task data and snack bar update and it should work exactly the same. Let's find out. Use main coroutine, all right, it works. So next one is step five. Use main coroutine rule for repository testing in the previous code lab you learned about dependency injection. This allows you to replace the production versions of classes with test versions of classes in your tests. Specifically, use constructed dependency injection. Here's an example from default tasks repository. Yep, I remember that. Uh, let's see, in the above, code, the above code injects the local and remote data source as well as coroutine dispatcher. Because the dispatcher is injected, 
you can use test coroutine dispatcher in your test, injecting coroutine dis the coroutine dispatcher as opposed to hard coding the dispatcher is a good habit when using coroutines. Let's use the injected um, test coroutine dispatcher in your tests. Um, okay. Add the main coroutine rule inside the default tasks repository test. Default tasks repository test right here. Import that, import that. Okay. Use dispatcher main instead of dispatcher unconfined when defining your repository under test similar to test coroutine dispatcher. Dispatchers that unconfined executes tasks immediately, but it doesn't include all the other testing benefits of test coroutine dispatcher, such as being able to pause execution. Get a reference. Okay, here swap dispatcher dot unconfined. Uh, and that's in the before function. Let me get rid of that. Okay. Uh, in the above code, remember that main coroutine rule swaps the dispatcher.main for a test coroutine dispatcher. Generally, one create, only create one test coroutine dispatcher to run a test. Whenever you call run blocking test, it will create a new test coroutine dispatcher. If you don't specify one, main coroutine rule and two, includes a test coroutine dispatcher. So to ensure that you don't accidentally create multiple instances of test coroutine dispatcher, use the main coroutine rule dot run blocking test instead of run blocking test. Replace run blocking test with with that, okay. Okay, um, run your Test class and confirm everything works as before. All right, let's run it. Okay. Let's see, I wanna look at that again. Class, main coroutine rule. Okay, so it instantiates the test coroutine dispatcher whenever it's instantiated. So you don't actually need to pass it in, do you? Yeah. So yeah, it'll instantiate it for you. And then test watcher, that's G unit, test coroutine scope by test coroutine scope. Is a delegate, pass the dispatcher, starting, finished, okay. I see. Okay, and the test passed. Awesome. All right, awesome job. Now you're using test coroutine dispatcher in your code, which is preferable dispatcher for testing. Next, you'll see how to use an additional feature of test, test coroutine dispatcher controlling coroutine execution timing. All right. Uh, okay. Um, in this step, you'll control how a coroutine executes in a test using test coroutines routine dispatchers, pause dispatcher, and resume dispatcher uh, methods. Using these methods, you'll create a test for loading, for the loading indicator of your statistics view model. As a reminder, statistics view model holds all the data and does all the calculations for the statistics screen. All right, step one, prepare statistics view model for testing first. You need to make sure you can inject your fake repository into your view model follow, following the process described in the previous code lab. As this is a review and unrelated to coroutine timing, feel free to copy and paste, open statistics view model, change the constructor of statistics view model, take in tasks repository instead of constructing it inside the class so that you can inject a fake repository for testing. Okay, so we're... Okay. 
I'm just gonna grab, I'm not grabbing all that. All right, this is statistics view model. Okay, we want to get rid of that one. And I don't like that it put it all on new lines. There we go. Okay, at the bottom of the statistics view model file outside the class, S at a factory. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Update statistics fragment to use the factory. All right, where's that? All right, excellent. Run your application code and navigate to the <coughs> statistics fragment to make sure your statistics screen works just like before. Nope, I'm familiar with doing this. I'm not gonna do that. All right, cre create statistics view model test. Now you are ready to create a test that pauses in the middle of coroutine execution for statistics view model test. Open statistics view model, right click the class name and then generate test, follow the prompts. All right, we're doing this in the test source set, okay. Um, next, uh, test source set. Okay, good. Uh, okay, follow the steps to below to set up your statistics view model test as described in the previous lessons. This is a good review of what goes into a view model test. Add the instant task executor rule. This will swap the background executor used by architecture components, which view models are part of for an executor which will run each task synchronously. This ensures your tests are deterministic. Add the main coroutine rule since you're testing coroutines and view models. Create fields for the subject under test, statistics view model, and test doubles for its dependencies. Create a before method that sets up the subject under test and dependencies. Your test should look like this. Okay. There we go. All right, uh, yep, we got the rule, makes it synchronous. Uh, main coroutine rule, that uses test coroutines dispatcher, uh, subject under test, um, the fake repository, and then the before instantiates them. All right, excellent. All right, create a loading indicator test. When, task, when the task statistics load, the app displays a loading indicator that disappears as soon as the data is loaded and the statistics calculations are done. You'll write a test that makes sure the loading indicator is shown while the statistics are loading and then disappears once the statistics are loaded. The refresh method in statistics view model controls when the loading indicator is shown and disappears. Okay. All right, notice the data loading is set to true. And then later the false, once the coroutine finishes, finishes refreshing the tasks, you need to check that this code properly updates the loading indicator. At first attempt to write a test, a first attempt might to write a test might look like this. All right, load the tasks, um, assert that. Okay, it, let's add this. Uh, Hamcrest matchers. 
All right, it says this should fail. Uh, because it says this test doesn't make any sense because it's testing data loading it is both true and false at the same time. Oh, I see. Looking at the error message, the test fails because the first assert statement. Um, the test coroutine dispatcher executes tasks immediately and completely, which means that the before the assert statements are executed, the statistics view model refresh method has completely finished. Okay. Often you, you do want this immediate execution so that your tests run fast, but in this case you're trying to check the state of the loading indicator in the middle of when refreshing is executing, as shown in the annotated code below. Mm -hmm. I see. In situations like these, you can use test coroutines, dispatchers, pause, and resume dispatcher. The main coroutine rule, uh, pause dispatcher, is shorthand for pausing the test coroutine dispatcher. When the dispatcher is paused, any new coroutines are added to a queue rather than being executed immediately. This means that code execution inside refresh will be paused just before the co coroutine is launched. Okay, uh, when you call main coroutine rule resume dispatcher, then all the code in the coroutine will be executed. Update the test code to use pause dispatcher and resume dispatcher so that you pause, uh, so that you pause before executing the coroutine check that the loading indicator is shown then resume and check the loading indicator is hidden oh i see so you add a pause and a continue yeah so it pauses it then does the code to test, assert that it's true, then you resume it, it'll finish, and then you assert that it's false. Makes sense. Let me run it. Run the test and see that it passes. If you need more even fine-grained timing control, test coroutine dispatcher provides that as well. Check out advanced time by advanced Advance until idle and run current. Excellent. You learn how to write coroutine tests that use test coroutine dispatcher's ability to pause and resume coroutine execution. This gives you more control in writing tests that require precise timing. And the test did pass. Excellent. All right. Task six, testing error handling. In testing, it's important to test both when the code executes uh, as expected, sometimes called happy path, and also what your app does when it encounters errors in edge cases. In this step, you'll add a test to your statistics view model test uh, con that confirms the correct behavior when the list of tasks can't be loaded. For example, if the network is down. Okay, step one, add an error flag to test double. First, you need to artificially cause the error situation. One way to do this is to update your test double so that you can set them to an error state using a flag. If the flag is false, the test double functions as normal, but if the flag is the true, then the test double returns a realistic error. For example, it might return a failure to load data error. Upon fake repository, uh, fake test repository, up, no, it says update fake test, the fake test repository to include an error flag, which when set the true causes the code to return a realistic error. Okay. Fake test repository, we're adding this flag. Uh, where is fake test repository? Oh, right there. All right, create a set return error method that changes when, whether or not the repository should return errors. Okay. I'm going to put it right at the top. All right. Wrap get task and get tasks in if statement so that if should return error is true, the method returns result.error. Okay, get tasks and get task.
Uh, okay. Step two, write a test for a return to error. Um, now you're ready to write a test for what happens in your statistics view model when the repository returns an error. In statistics view model, there are two live data booleans, error and empty. Um, okay, these represent whether or not tasks loaded properly. If there's an error, error and empty should both be true. Open statistics view model test. Create a new test called load uh, statistics when tasks are unavailable. Call error to display. Uh, call set return error on the task repository, setting it to true. Check the statistics view model dot empty and statistics view model dot error are both true. The full code for this test is right there. Okay. What test was this? The statistic, statistics view model test. Statistics view model test. All right. Um, in summary, the general strategy for test error handling is to modify your test level so that you can set them to an error state or various error states if you have multiple. Then you can write tests for these error states. Good work. I don't know, I feel like it would be better to just pass in data with that, that would cause that error, but this is related to network state, so I guess you could, you'd have to do that artificially with the flag. Uh, let me run this. Excellent, it works. All right, testing room. In this step, you learn how to write tests for your room database. You'll first write tests for your room data access object and then for the local data source class. Add the architecture component testing library to Gradle. Add the architecture component testing library. Okay, let's add this to Gradle. All right, create the task DAO test class. Room DAOs are actually interfaces that Room turns into classes via magic of annotation processing. It usually doesn't make sense to generate a test class for an interface, so there's no keyboard shortcut, and you'll need to create the test uh, class manually. Create a task DAO test class. In your project pane, navigate the Android test data source. Okay, so we're just gonna make this in local. Uh, or do we need to make, oh, we need to make a package called local. Okay. All right, that's synced, awesome. And this is in Android test. Uh, new package, local, and then we add that new class, tasks DAO test. All right. All right, which, uh, let's see, which source set should you put your database tests in? Note that in general, make database tests instrument the test, meaning they will be run in the Android test source set. This is because if you run these tests locally, they'll use whatever version of SQLite you have on your local machine, uh, which could be very different from the version of SQLite that ships with, the Andro with your Android device. Different Android devices also ship with different SQLite versions, so it's helpful as well to be able to run these tests as instrumented tests on different devices. Copy the following code to start your task DAO test. All right, import everything. Nope. Oh, I've run into this problem before. Um, 
It has to do with something with coroutine, um, Coroutine's version. I need to update that. I believe that's the problem. Oh, um, what is the latest version? 1.5.2. Oh, there's two here. Get rid of the old one. All right, did that fix it? There we go. Just had to update that. Awesome. All right, notice the three annotations. Experiment with the coroutines API. You'll be using your own blocking test, which is part of Kotlin coroutines test. Thus, you need this annotation. Oops. Okay. Um, small test marks the test as a small runtime integration test versus medium test integration test and large tests and end, end tests. Uh, this helps you group and choose which size test to run. DAO tests are considered unit tests since you are only testing the DAO. Thus, you can call them small tests. All right, run with uh, Android J Unit 4 used in any class using Android X test. This was covered in the first code lab. To get access to an instance of your DAO, you'll need to build an instance of your database. Do that in your test. Do the following. Um, create a late init for your database. Okay. Make a before method initializing your database. Specifically, when initializing a database for testing, create an in-memory database uh, normal databases are meant to persist. By comparison, an in-memory database will be completely deleted once the process that created it is killed, since it's never actually stored on disk. Always use an in-memory database for your test. Uh, in in-memory, okay. Use Android X test libraries, application provider, get application context method to get the application context, okay. So here's our before function. Okay, make an after method for cleaning up your database using database.close. Okay, once done, your code should look like this. Yep, that's what it looks like. Write your first DAO test, your first DOA test will insert a task and get the task um, by its ID. All right, still in the test, copy this code. All right, let's import everything. Uh, which assert that we do we want? We want uh, Hamcrest, I believe. Yep. Hamcrest uh, matchers. And then is Hamcrest matchers. Awesome. All right. Let's run that. I bet that's what we do. Okay. This test does the following creates a task, inserts it in the database, retrieves the task using an ID that all its properties match the inserted task. Notice. Uh, you run the test using run blocking test. Yep, I see that because both insert task and get test by ID are suspend functions. Use DAO as normal, accessing it from your database instance. If needed, here are the imports. I think I got that. All right, step five, try it yourself. Now by trying to write a DAO test yourself, oh, did it run? It did, awesome, and it passed, good. Oh, oops.
All right. Finish the code referring to insert task and get by ID. Test you just added. Run your test and confirm it passes. The completed test is in the end code lab three branch. Uh, so you can compare. Uh, Enter task and get by ID. Up to task. Um, oh, so it's going to be pretty similar to this. Let's see. Update task and get by the insert task can get by the uh, you know what I'm just gonna what am I gonna do I'm going to uh, just look at the git differences compare with branch and code lab 3 Oh, it doesn't have it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to see. Skip that for now. Uh, but it's going to be pretty similar to this. Insert. Uh, and let's see. I mean, it's honestly pretty almost identical. All right, let me keep this clean. Okay, first we want to insert a task. Okay. Uh, two, update the task by creating a new task with the same ID. Update the task by creating a new task. A new task with the same ID. So I think we just fetch it, and I'll have that ID. All right. Because does it make an ID automatically? Yeah, it does. Oh, never mind. So we don't need that. Um, but different attributes. I think we can just ch change... Um, Change, uh, I am a new description. We could just change this, right? And then database.task, DOA, is there an update? Update task, and then pass the task. Okay, and then assert that. Um, well, then we have to fetch the loaded. Yes, yeah, so we get the loaded one and make sure it matches that one. I think this should work. Let's see. Inside run blocking test. Now I think it'll work. Uh, let's see. Let's it launched. Yep, there we go. It worked. 
for task to local data source. Uh, you just created a unit test. Let's see. You just created unit test for your task DAO. Next, you'll create integration test for task local data source. Test local data source is a class that takes information re returned by the DAO and converts it into a format that is expected by your repository class. For example, it wraps return values with success error states. You'll be writing an integration test you, because you'll test both the real task local data source and real DAO code. Okay. The steps for creating ta tests for your task local data source set are very similar to creating DAO tests. Open your task local data source class, right click, generate test, and it's going to go on Android test source set. Okay. This is for task local data source. Um, generate uh, test. Let's go. And it is an Android test. Okay. Add. Copy the following code. Excellent. Okay. Notice that the only real difference between this and the DAO testing code is that task to local data source can be considered a medium integration test as seen by medium test annotation because the task to local data source set will test both the code in local task data source and how it integrates with the DAO code. Okay, in task to local data source set, create a late init field for the two components you're testing. Test local data source and your database. Okay. Make a before method for initializing your database and data sources. Create your database the same way you did for your DAO test using the in memory database builder and application provider dot get application context method. Add allow main thread queries. Normally, Room doesn't allow database queries to be run on the main thread. Calling allow main thread queries turns off this check. Don't do this in production code. Definitely not. Uh, instantiate the local task data source using your database and dispatcher's main. This will run your queries on the main thread. This is allowed because of allow main thread queries. I wonder why not just do it with... Um, the other way we were doing it before hmm all right make an after method for cleaning up your database with database.close okay Write your first local tasks, your task local D data source test. Um, okay, here's the test. Okay, there's an issue here. is we want the ham crest matchers import there we go um there's an issue replace with run blocking test once the issue is resolved okay this is very similar to your dao test like the dao test this test creates a task inserts it into the database Retrieves the task using its ID, asserts that the tasks were retrieved, and that all the properties match the inserted task. The only real difference from the an analogous DAO test is that the local data source returns an instance of the sealed result class, which is the f 
which is the format the repository expects. For example, this line here casts a result as success. Assert that result succeeded is true, result as success. Um, okay. And it says run the test. I'm going to try replace this with run blocking test because we updated the version of oops oh, ran it in debug mode we updated the version of coroutine so I wonder if it'll work maybe that's where the update was to fix that nope Okay, write your own local data source test. Now it's your turn. Copy the following code. All right, that worked. Awesome. Finish the code referring to the save test, retrieve test test you added previously as needed. Run your test and confirm it passes. Completed tests um, are in that branch. Okay. Let's read what we have to do. Save a new active test in the local data source. All right. Um, uh, we got to do equals run blocking. Okay. Market is complete. Market is complete. Confused here. Uh, is it is it wrapped in it? Uh, result. Okay, so it's wrapped in there somehow. I gotta get it out. So it's wrapped in this result. Um, how do I get it out? Oops. Okay, result succeeded. Result. Data, maybe? can see it has save task that saves it local data source get task that just returns a result oh there you go result result dot data I'm looking right at it how come that didn't show up when I typed it 
It still doesn't. Uh, why is this not? I am confused. Wait, result succeeded. Oh, okay, I see. Market is complete. Okay, so we have to cast it first. I see, okay. Okay, succeeded is completed, so we have to verify that it's false. All right, then it gets cast, and then we set it to true. Um, complete task, retrieve task is com complete task, retrieve task is complete. So market is completed. Uh, check that the task can be retrieved from the local data source and end it. Okay, so we have to update uh, that local data source dot say or is there I can't type update where is is it like oh we could just call complete task and that'll do it for us Oh, oh, I see. That is nice. Um, uh, did I just close that test? Okay. Oh, there we go. So then, okay, market is, so update. I like that. Why is my auto complete not working though? Complete task. And then check that the task uh, can be retrieved. Gosh. Okay. All right, let me what is it? Get task, fetch task, get task, and then we do okay. Okay, we mark it as complete. Check that the test can be retrieved from the local data source and is complete. Assert that succeeded is true. Results and then assert that uh, okay result that data that is completed. All right, I think that's it. There we go, it worked, awesome. Okay, wait, did I skip past one? I did. Okay, eight, end-to-end -end data binding. All right, uh, up until now, in this series of code labs, you've written unit tests and integration tests. Integration tests like task detail fragment tests focus solely on testing the functionality of a single fragment. 
without moving to any other fragments or even creating the activity. Similarly, task's local data source set tests a few classes working together in the data layer, but doesn't actually check the UI. And to end tests, test a combination of features working together. They, t they test large portions of the app and simulate real usage. By and large, these tests are instrumented tests in the Android test source set. Here are a few differences between end-to-end -end tests and integration tests relating to the to-do app. E2E tests, uh, start the app from the first screen, create an actual activity in a repository, test multiple fragments working together. Writing end-to-end -end tests gets complicated real fast, I bet. Uh, and so there are a lot of tools, libraries to make it easier. Espresso is an Android UI testing library commonly used to write end-to-end -end tests. <clears throat> you learn the basics of using Espresso in the previous code lab. Uh, in the previous, the pre <clears throat> this code lab assumes that you have basic familiarity with Espresso. If you do not, the Espresso content in the previous code lab covers how to write integration tests using Espresso. All right, in this step, you'll re you'll be writing a true end-to-end -end test. You'll use Espresso idling resource to properly handle writing end-to-end -end tests that involve both long-running operations and the data binding library. You'll first add a task, test that edits a saved task. Step one, turn off animations. I've already done this. Um, okay. <clears throat> Step two, create test activity test. Create a file and class called test tasks activity test in Android test. Um, yeah, does that activity already exist? Um, tasks activity, it does exist. Let's create it here. Uh, uh, generate test, tasks activity test, awesome. We'll put an Android test source set and then add that to Git. Okay, and then there's a bunch of stuff. Create the before, after. I'm just going to copy all that. And then import. How do you determine whether cleanup code runs before or after a test? The code and after methods should make sure you don't end up with memory leaks or code which is still running after the test is completed. For example, cleaning up coroutines or closing a database. The code and before methods ensure that, you're, that the state of your code is exactly as it should be before going into your test. All right, write, writing an end-to-end -end espresso test. Time to write an end-to-end -end espresso test first. Editing a saved task. Open tasks activity test. Okay, here's the test. Add the following skeleton code. Okay. Notice run blocking is used to wait for all suspend functions to finish before continuing with the execution in the block. Note that we're using run blocking instead of run blocking test because of a bug, okay. Activity scenario, it's an Android X testing library uh, that wraps around an activity and gives you direct control over the activity's life cycle for testing. It is similar to fragment scenario. When using activity scenario, you start the activity using launch and then at the end of the test call close. You must set the initial state of the data layer, such as adding tasks to the repository, before calling activity scenario launch. If you're using a database, which you are, you must close the database at the end of the test. <clears throat> what about activity, activity scenario rule? 
Note that there is an activity scenario rule which calls launch and close for you. As mentioned, any setup of the data state, such as adding tasks to the repository, must happen before activity scenario launch is called. Calling additional setup code, such as saving tasks to the repository, is not currently supported by activity scenario rule. Therefore, we choose not to use activity scenario rule and instead manually call launch and close. This is the basic setup for any test involving an activity. Between when you launch the activity scenario and close the activity scenario, you can write your own espresso code. Add the espresso code as seen below. All right. We want the espresso matchers matches, and it is this one it is checked. Not or is not. That's part of espresso, or I believe, or it's Hamcrest, probably Hamcrest. There we go. Uh, here are the imports. Okay, note that in this in the end test, you don't verify integration with the repository, the navigation controller, or any other components at all. That is what's known as a black box test. This test is not supposed to know how things are implemented internally, only the outcome for a given input. Run this test five times. Note that the test is flaky, meaning sometimes it will pass and sometimes it will fail. Um, all right, let's let's see that. Five times. The reason that the test sometimes fails is a timing and test synchronization issue. Uh, Espresso synchronizes between UI actions and resulting changes in the UI. For example, let's say you tell Espresso to click a button on your behalf. Mm. And then check whether the certain whether certain views are visible. Espresso will wait for the new views to display after you perform the click in step one before checking whether there's text the next screen in step two. There are some situations though where Espresso's built-in synchronization method <clears throat> mechanism won't know to wait long enough for a view to update. For example, when you need to load some data for a view, Espresso doesn't know when the data load is finished. Espresso also doesn't know when the data binding library is still updating the view. <clears throat> in situations where Espresso cannot tell uh, whether the app is busy updating the UI or not, you can use idling resources synchronization method mechanism. This is a way to explicitly tell Espresso when the app is idle, meaning Espresso should continue interacting and checking the app or not, meaning Espresso should wait. The general way you use idling resources is like this. Uh, create an idling resource or subclass of one of uh, as a singleton in your application code, in your application code, not your test code, add the logic to track whether the app is idle or not by changing the state of idling resource to idle or not. Calling idling registry .get instance register before each test to register the idling resource. By registering the idling resource, Espresso will wait until it is idle before moving to the next Espresso statement. Calling that uh, unregister after each test to unregister the idling resource. <clears throat> Note, it is unusual to have testing code in your application. Uh, to understand more about why and methods of removing idling resource from your application code, check out Android testing with Espresso idling resources and testing fidelity. Add an idling resource to your Gradle file. Um, let's see, that time it passed. I wonder if we can get it to fail. I'm going to run it again. And while it's doing that, I'm going to add it to Gradle. I'm going to run it again. That's twice it passed. Uh, 
also add the following options return default values true to test option that unit test All right, that's three times in a row it passed. I'll assume it is flaky though. Nine, idling resource singleton. You'll add two idling resources, one to deal with data binding synchronization for your views and another to deal with the long running operation in your repository. You start with the idling resource related to long running repository operations. Create a new file called espresso idling resource Kotlin file. And uh, in the util package, espresso idling resource in the util, and it's an object. Um, in here, right there. Okay. Let's grab all that code and we put it there. <clears throat> Import. Awesome. Let me look at the code real quick. All right, global. That's a string. Um, JVM field counting idling resource equals counting idling resource, and it passes some kind of a tag. Okay, increment. Increment, decrement, if counting is, well, if it's not idle, then decrement, I see. All right, this code creates a singleton idling resource using Kotlin's object keyword called counting idling resource. You're using counting idling resource class here. Counting idling resource allows you to increment and decrement counter such that when the counter is greater than zero, the app is considered working. When the counter is zero, the app is idle. Basically, whenever the app starts doing some work, increment the counter. When that work finishes, decrement the counter. Therefore, counting idling resource will only have a count of zero if there is no work being done. This is a singleton so that you can access the idling resource anywhere in the app where long running work might be done. Uh, create wrap idling espresso, espresso idling resource. Okay. Create that. <clears throat> oh, that's an example. Okay, you can simplify this by creating an inline function called wrap espresso idling resource in the espresso idling resource file. Below the singleton you created, add the following code. Okay, so it's an inline function. And we do this. Below the singleton. So I think down here, right? Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, this starts by incrementing the count, run whatever code it's wrapped around, then decrement the count. Here's an example uh, how you use, how you'd use wrap espresso idling resource, okay. <clears throat> Step seven. Use wrap espresso idling resource in the default task repository. Next, wrap your long running operations with wrap espresso idling resource. The majority of these are in your default task repository in your application code. Uh, open data source, default task repository. Wrap all methods in default task repository with that resource. Here's an example. All right, so this is our get task. We have to wrap all of them. Um, uh, defaults tasks. That's, this is get tasks. Is this it? Okay. So essentially, 
they're, they all get wrapped. Even the return? Yeah. Okay. Even the return. Okay. Oops. Wrapping basically all of these in that resource. This isn't too bad, you don't have to track down a bunch of code. <clears throat> it's all, all in one place. Okay, they're all wrapped now. <clears throat> uh, the full code can be found here. Okay, write data binding, idling resource. You've written an idling resource so that Espresso waits for data to be loaded. Next, you'll create a custom idling resource for data binding. You need to do this because Espresso doesn't automatically work with data binding library. This is because data binding uses a different mechanism, the choreographer class, to synchronize its view updates. Thus, Espresso cannot tell when a view updated via data binding has finished updating. Because this data binding <coughs> idling resource code is complicated, the code is provided and explained. All right, this is going into that same utility function or package. Okay, and we'll grab all of that. Oh, there's quite a bit. Is there a way just to grab all the imports? Uh, no. <clears throat> Actually, is there a way um, optimize imports? No, it just gets rid of them. Must have got the wrong import. Uh... <clears throat> okay. Let's see, there's a lot going on here, but the general idea is that view data binding is, bindings are generated whenever you're using data binding layouts. The view bind, data bindings has pending bindings method reports back whether the data binding library needs to update the UI to reflect the change in data. This idling resource is considered idle only if there are no pending bindings for any of the view data bindings. Finally, 
the extension functions, data binding, idling resource, dot monitor fragment, and monitor activity taken fragment scenarios and activity scenarios respectively. <clears throat> they then find the underlying activity and associate it with data binding idling resource so that you can track the layout state. You must call one of these methods from your test, otherwise data binding idling resource won't know anything about your layout. Use idling resource in tests. Uh, you've created two idling resources and ensure that they're properly set by as busy or idle. Espresso only waits for idling resources when they are registered. So now your tests need to register and unregister your idling resources. You'll do so in a tasks activity test. Open that test, instantiate a private data binding idling resource. Okay. <clears throat> but this isn't working, and why not? Um, let me get rid of these again and just start over. <clears throat> I don't know why that's throwing an error, but maybe it'll just go away on its own. Um, okay, add this to tasks activity test. All right, create a before and after method. Okay, we register and unregister. Okay, remember that both counting idling resource and data binding idling resource are monitored are monitoring monitoring your app code, watching whether or not it is idle. By registering these resources in your test. We, when either resource is busy, Espresso will wait until they are idle um, before moving to the next command. What this means is that if your counting idling resource has a count greater than zero or if there are pending data binding layouts, Espresso will wait. Update the edit task test so that after you launch the activity scenario, you use monitor activity to associate the activity with data binding idling resource. Okay, that's after we instantiate the activity scenario. Okay. Okay. Run your test five times. You should no longer see a flaky. Well, it wasn't before, but let's just make sure it works. The entire task activity test should look like this. Okay, step 10, write your own test with idling resources. Um, <laughs> Let's look at the completed test. All right, task activity test. 
Is that on the right branch? Yeah, it is. Encode lab three. Okay, so I have all that. I, I need to look up. Um, I need to look up the. Let's see, this is Andrew Test. The idling resource. There's something off there. They called it something different. View extension. Hmm. What do they call it? They Is that not in this repository? In this repository. Okay. So they just call it view extension. They don't even have That is odd. Okay, here's the test. Let's look at these imports to see if we can find it. Um, okay, there it is. Util data binding idling resource. I was just looking right there and I did not see it. Util. It must be inside here. Am I on the right branch? I am. Oh, I wonder. I think it's probably in Android test. Yeah, okay, that's the issue. So I have this in the wrong. Let me grab this and do, I'm gonna cut it. Uh, where's cut? We'll paste it in. All right, we need to create, where's that? Blueprints to do app util. Paste it there, refactor. Uh, let me do a clean. <clears throat> build and then I'm just gonna grab all this code just in case I typed something or copied something wrong I must have because now it works. <clears throat> okay. Now let me run that test. Get rid of this. Oh, this is create one task, delete a task. Um, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> okay. Last one, and then navigation testing. Okay, set. Okay, add the appropriate annotations. 
what's this for? I'll create a file called app navigation test and and uh, Android test source set. Um, okay. Is this working or not? Um, okay. And we add all this. Okay, there, that test looks like it's finally working. Excellent. It worked. Alright, set up your navigation tests. Okay. <clears throat> Write your navigation tests. Um, here's an extension function we add to the end of this test outside the scope. All right. All right, and then here's some example code, clicking um, certain views on the toolbar for navigation, perform clicks, checking the navigation. Um, I'm not gonna write all these tests, it's uh, for another day, but um, yeah, this one was long. There's a lot here. Um, Oh no, this is the last one. I mean, there is a lot to, t I feel like you could make a whole career out of just being an Android test writer, just writing tests. Um, there's a lot for sure. And kind of realize people, a lot of teams get away from it just because there's so much to do. And it's like, if you're gonna write good, meaningful tests, it's a lot of work. <clears throat> um, but, yeah, I could see if you, if you did this all the time, all your tasks, all your stories, and you got used to it, um, you know, that was the norm. It could be really useful, but it also adds more work for sure. Um, but that work may save you in dealing with defects. So uh, I think it's a good trade-off. This is a good code lab, but just a lot to it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.